Yeah. What potential of diversity issues for most people that pursue degrees for MLIS or things that they don't quite have the skills to know? We've done that now the third year. And this year, this is smaller. I'm not involved in my treatment side anymore. But we had a situation this year. seem to be quiet. We could start earlier. <laughs> well, since everybody is so quiet, thank you everybody for coming. It's great to see a full room. I am uh, Francesca Marini from Texas A&M University. I'm Associate Dean uh, for Special Collections in the Libraries and Director of the Cushing Library which is Special Collections, Rare Books, and Archives. I am very happy to moderate this panel with our wonderful speakers on the Diversity Alliance residency program at Texas A&M. We are just starting now. We have our first residence starting in June, so I'm very excited to hear other points of views. So we're trying to give different perspectives from uh, setting up the program, the challenges, coordinating the program, uh, the experience of the residents, and then the, the a ACRL experience of pioneering everything. So the Alliance started, officially launched in 2016, so it's still relatively new. And uh, already 36 institutions have joined and there are more joining. So it's thriving and it's, we're very happy about that. <laughs> so we're gonna have uh, first uh, Dean uh, Tyler Walters uh, from the uh, University Libraries at Virginia Tech. And he's gonna speak about establishing the Diversity Alliance. And then we will have uh, Leo Agnew, Director of Human Resources and Diversity Programs <coughs> at the University of, of Iowa. And he, he'll speak about the resident coordinator experience. And then we have Lori Ostatler, <coughs> Assistant Director and Assistant University Librarian at West Virginia University Libraries and West Virginia and Regional History Center. And she'll talk about setting up the program and the su successes and challenges. Then we're going to hear from two former residents, uh, um, Ashley Corrin, who's now a Special Collections Librarian for Teaching and Learning in the Special Collections and University Archives at the University of Maryland, and Charles Ear, uh, Research and Instruction Services at Iowa State University. And we're very excited about having the actual former residents speak. And then uh, Mary Ellen Davis, uh, Executive Director of uh, ACRL, <laughs> is going to conclude and talk about the ACRL perspective and mission. Uh, if you have the package for the conference, the full bios are there, so I'm not gonna read everything in detail because I wanna leave you space to speak. And sorry, I'm a little <laughs> anxious about <laughs> speaking in public, so occasionally I kind of choke up. <laughs> so thank you everybody, big round of applause to our speakers, and I'll introduce you. All right, good morning, everybody. You're about to get the unauthorized pre-ACRL days version of behind the scenes at the Diversity Alliance, what was going on. <clears throat> so this will be the prettiest slide you see after this. Not so pretty, but informative. 
so it's something you take away later. So I wanted to just kind of quickly give you a, a timeline at the beginning here <clears throat> and talk a little bit about what happened and I'll fill in some gaps as I go along. But we really started kind of in 2014 discussing this and who is the we. Uh, this is really the brainchild of John Cawthorn, who is the Dean of Libraries at that time at West Virginia University. He, he's now at Wayne State. Um, John's early experience in his own career was he was a resident librarian in a program, I'll say many years ago, I'm gonna date him, uh, at Ohio State University. So I think he's, he told us he's always had that in his mind and wanted to build something along those lines, but here we were in 2014 and he wanted to get a hold of some colleagues and talk about how do we, how do, we do a residency program for underrepresented populations today? What have we learned from past residency programs? How do we go forward? <clears throat> So the other folks are John Culshaw at Iowa, Nancy Davenport at American University, and myself. And quick, maybe a little funny aside is we probably were in our third or fourth meeting forming this group, and I think Nancy looked at John Cawthorn and said, John, how did you pick the three of us to work with you on this? And he smiled real big and said, I called 20 of my friends and you were the only three who said yes. <laughs> <laughs> So we laughed pretty hard at that. Well, that was a very scientific method, but, but I think that we were, we were proud of the fact that here's our friend, John, calling us saying, hey, I got this idea. I really need you to get on board. Can, are you interested? And I, you know, I think it was an honor to you know, get the call and, and to be working on it. So some of us gathered uh, August of 14 at, at West Virginia U and started talking about these things. We did meet with the provost's office and got some advice and input there. So a lot of planning and discussion and most of my talk is going to be about kind of the characteristics of the program. That's what we spent time really meeting and talking about is what are these qualities or characteristics we want in this <clears throat> in this program. So that was a lot of the 2014 early 15 talk but pretty quickly we moved to job descriptions and searching for resident librarians that began late summer or early fall in 15 and we coordinated those. We made sure uh, language in our job descriptions were uh, coordinated in that sense. And, and we went forward. But it wasn't that long after that that we had about, we were probably, I would say, three or four months into this, and we had uh, maybe 20, close to 20 libraries were expressing interest to, to John Cawthorn about, tell me more about this diversity alliance and how do I get into it? Well, that's when we called Mary Ellen. So we'll, we'll let her fill it in from there. But you know, we're very, very thankful to the ACRL for, for advancing this program. So some of the main events were we, we developed an annual institute, which was multi-day, you know, three, four days at our organizations. And the first one was summer of 15 at, at West Virginia, then April of 16 at Iowa, uh, May of 17, we split it between Virginia Tech and then put everybody in, a, in bus and cars and went up to DC for American <coughs> University. And in those uh, institutes, we spent a lot of time with other officials from the university. We had VPs for research, we had provosts, we had one president come and, come and remark. Um, other deans, so it was a really excellent opportunity for our residents going forward. Okay, so the real, the real core of it, program characteristics. <clears throat> so as you know, I mean, this is a, this is a, in some ways, a common residency program that you see, and we talked a lot about where would these people come from. We wanted to see, you know, just the base of our profession, our subfield in terms of kind of academic and research libraries, obviously be more inclusive, be more diverse. And that was the idea. It was like, what do we do? How do we, how do, we do this? How do we attract people? So, of course, we thought about there's going to be recent graduates from LAS schools, but we also thought, you know, there's a whole lot of librarians out there who are not in academia, public, uh, special, school, et cetera, that may, you know, may want to make that shift but don't know how, don't know the culture, don't know the institutional setting, and that perhaps this kind of program would be of help to them. So we kind of had our minds on, on those two kinds of groups of folks going forward. <clears throat> and so the first item we talked a lot about was how this needed to be very resident librarian centered. We wanted to focus on the resident. We noted that you know, not all programs are perfect. Our program is not perfect. And what happens sometimes in these programs is you know, uh, a library department latches on to a resident librarian and say, I've got my pet projects, I need you to do this. It happens, sometimes it's good, but not always. We want to be very focused on, this is about the development and support and maturation of the resident librarian. And one way we fixed that was to say, when you come in, you're not gonna be in one department, you're gonna start somewhere, but you're gonna have multiple appointments in your three year period. So we tried to you know, avoid that, you know, kind of getting sucked up into one department. 
And we wanted to focus on, again, how does this person integrate into academic librarianship, understand the college university setting, uh, encourage him or her to seek their interests in going forward, and especially to focus a little bit on what's it like to produce your own research and scholarship. Because if you're going to be in this setting, there's a good likelihood that you're going to need to do that. You'll either be highly encouraged or required to do it. So I think one of the unique things was <clears throat> there are a lot of good, very good residence programs. They're very institutionally based in one setting. But we talked about, you know, we didn't really want that. We thought, okay, this is, you know, we started this as 2014, 15, and we realized there is this thing called the World Wide Web and people can talk to one another between institutions. So, but it's amazing how face-to-face -face actually fosters that going forward. So we talked about projects and assignments, which we, you know, we, we kind of encourage projects to go on, but we, we saw these annual institutes as a way for all of us to bond, especially the residents together. We use webinars to get people to meet over certain topics and, and talk and discuss. So we were looking for ways to connect our residents across the four institutions. We wanted a longer residency. There are plenty of residencies that are like one or two years long, and again, there, there, there's certainly some effectiveness that goes on there, but we noted, especially from the University of Iowa that had a residency program uh, established already, that a two-year program, what happens a lot of times is that residents looking for a job after the first 12 months. So that ends up being, and, and, and why not? You know, they have 24-month job, they need a job. So we thought that was a bit problematic or, or just not as good as we wanted it to be. So this person has one year of experience with you. So we really wanted to make, for at least the four of us starting out, we wanted this to be a three-year program. Now, as we've gone forward with ACRL, we, we've, and we, our language is we highly encourage the three years, but we really require a base of two. The point is the more time in the residency program, the more this person is gonna develop and grow and be supported. So as I said, three years. Um, well, this is segueing to uh, the principles now that are kind of really established by ACRL. So you'll see some of the, the talking points that I've had, some of the, the characteristics I've been discussing in our early conversations and how they've translated into kind of the, the official printed principles of the Diversity Alliance as an ACRL program. So the two to three year period, you know, designing local experiences, rotation through more units than just one, active memberships, uh, you know, acting as a resource for other Alliance members as they come about. I believe Marianne will tell us, but I believe it's 34, unless something's 36, 36, going on 37. So this is, you know, this is phenomenal. Um, we wanted to treat the resident not differently in terms of we saw these as entry level opportunities. So we didn't want to underpay or under support this position. That was a, a uh, commitment we made to ourselves that have translated into the, into the principles. So I'm going to stop there we can take questions later but these are some of my contact points so i'm always happy to talk more about this later on as we go forward but thank you for your time did they figure it out no no so i assume i get the extra time all right, hi, I'm Leo with the University of Iowa Libraries, Residency Coordinator. I'm here to talk about the learning points that I have gained as coordinator of the residency program. Those include adapt, modify, and clarify. Just a little bit about our program. We now have a three-year program. It targets members of historically underrepresented groups. It's a three-year appointment, and residents are not automatically eligible. They're not eligible for placement, but they can't apply for a job if they find something of interest. So we intend for them to go elsewhere, go to your place when we're done. In terms of adapt, what I've learned is to, the need to adapt between cohorts, which means assessment. Initially our program was a two-year program and the residents were assigned only to our research and library instruction. Then about five years ago with a cohort, we offered our departments to write a proposal of interest, and we ended up having four different units express an interest of which we hired two in place two. So we expanded it between cohorts. The current cohort, which we hired in 2015, we changed to a three-year program for the, for the logistics. 
that were mentioned earlier, it was just practical for us to keep them two years instead of one. It gave us more time to use their skills and abilities. And we found from an assessment it was less stress because on residents because then they, instead of looking for jobs after 12 months, they could wait until 24 months. So it's practical on our end and seemed to be a benefit for the residents on their end. So with each assessment, each cohort, assess and change as necessary. In terms of modifying, with our current cohort, we, we modified it mid-term. It was a three-year program. Year one was intended to be uh, and turned out to be immersion into a particular position in a particular department. Year two was supposed to be forced rotation. Year three was going to be immersion back into a department that was going to be a launching pad for their professional job. In talking with residents and talking with department heads and talking with their AULs, we got away from the forced rotation. We ended up determining the, for this cohort, it would not have been added value of forcing them to leave their, place, their home to go work in a place for three or four months just because we said they needed to. What we did then is that we said, okay, year two, we will help you respond to collaborative projects with other departments. <coughs> if you want to go work part-time in another department, we'll make that happen. They all wanted to stay in their home base. Some wanted to work in another department, some wanted to work on projects. So we, we, we modified it midterm. Another modification we made midterm is that Initially, I was not only the resident coordinator, but their administrative supervisor. What a scary thought that was. <laughs> I, and then their department heads were their functional supervisors. As it turns out, that didn't work very well, especially in the area of our residents understanding the difference between functional and administrative supervisor and who to ask for what. Time off, travel. So we said, let's eliminate that stress. Made the department heads their administrative supervisors. I still retained program director, and it worked fine. It also meant three less performance evaluations <laughs> that I had to do. <laughs> Silver lining. Then the, that's adapt, modify, and then clarify. Learn the, I learned the hard way. You have to be painfully clear to your staff and the search committee what you mean by historically underrepresented groups. With our current cohort, when he did the search committee, I was clear that we meant women and minorities. I had a, a committee member resign because we did not include LGBTQ. You have to be clear on what you mean when you hire, when you get the search team get started, when you do the recruitment, when you do the selection. You have to be clear, and that starts at the top. What does the dean want? How does he or she see it? so that I, at the residency coordinator, can execute it. So, um, if I had not sent an encrypted document, you would be seeing what, I, what it's called, it's Iowa Residency Program three-year outline. But I do have 40 copies. I didn't expect so many. I have 40, I have my business card. If you'd like to send for me to send you a copy, but basically what it is, it's, it's a distillation of the job ad, which as you know in job ads are so verbose, it's hard sometimes for residents to pick out what are the core issues, or what, what's the purpose, what are the outcomes, what are the objectives. So I, I um, put together an advice, what I call it an informal advisory team. That was another modification. Uh, people who are not on the search committee, not department heads, but were recent hires. We volunteered to be an informal mentoring group. I called them the A-team, the advisory team. And they, they were part of the search process, so they provided the residents an opportunity to ask about the community. Then they met with the residents as they needed to once they were hired. Continued for that transi transition from geographic point A to geographic point B. And they, they still serve as advisors to me. One of their members said, took the task of taking the job ad and distilling it into a, a much cleaner outline that we can now give to residents or link to a next job ad. So what it includes are statements of purpose, providing immersion, provide mentorship, opportunity to focus on interest, professional engagement. It includes active participation in the university library committees, first-hand experience with research and scholarship, 
and so forth. Deliverables, year one. Meaningful work experience within one of several library departments. Exposure to library practices and academic librarianship. External professional development. That's year one. Year two, option to rotate through departments. Option to collaborate with other departments. Projects that are tailored to his or her professional interest. And a project that leads to publication, poster, whatever it might be. Something that, that gets them out in the library community looks good on a resume. Year three, back uh, same related responsibilities in an identified area of specialization. The outcomes are listed here to demonstrate skills at professional level, develop a professional network, be prepared for your next career opportunity. So those are things that have just happened in the last two and a half years to make our program better. Uh, just recently I sent our residents a another online assessment. What was their experience like? What could we do better? I've not yet had a chance to assess the feedback, but that's part of the ongoing assessment. Uh, one of the challenges was to uh, provide assurance of anonymity. And so I did not send out the survey. I did not receive the results, nor did anyone in the library. We were lucky to have a department on campus that does surveys. So I reached out to the director and said, would you help? He said yes, so he sent the survey. He's doing the assessment, he's doing the, the report. And that was provided, that information was provided in the survey announcement that a neutral third party was looking at the data, uh, de de uh, identifying anything that could be identified, then we'll get the report. Part of uh, residency program here. How am I doing on time? Almost out, but you're okay. What else can I do? <laughs> um, I think that's it. I'll, I'll see if there are any questions at the end. Thank you so much. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for giving a moment to get the technology straight. I'm Lori Hostetler from West Virginia University Libraries. And we began a new residency program in 2015 under the leadership of uh, Dean John Cawthorn, um, as Tyler mentioned. At the same time we were starting this new residency program, we were also um, uh, involved in the creation of the Diversity Alliance. It was a lot of work, um, and we've learned a lot in the process. So in 2015, uh, we had three resident librarians who uh, were recruited for our three-year program. And uh, now in what would be near the end of their three-year term, um, they've all moved on and we're beginning the search for a new resident librarian. So my presentation um, highlights the areas for consideration um, from my perspective as the residency program uh, implementation chair uh, at WVU and also come in part from a facilitated assessment of our program that took place in the fall of 2017. So, so my presentation does, is more like a lot of pretty pictures of West Virginia and an outline <coughs> to keep me on <laughs> track. Um, so uh, program structure uh, or features, uh, there's a, a lot of um, diversity in programs and um, you know as Tyler mentioned we settled on a three-year um, program and to be in the diversity alliance you have to have a two or three year um, program but these are some of the um, just some of my thoughts about uh, getting started and some of just a few of the areas uh, to, to take a look at so 
Um, just basic program structure in addition to the length. Um, you can think about whether it's a dedicated program. Um, so someone comes in as their uh, the research services resident librarian, where they come in with no connection to a specific um, department. Um, and um, so there's lots of variations, and uh, from what I can tell, um, that's great, and there's no one magic uh, formula. So the first thing I want to mention uh, would be onboarding. Um, this is something that uh, we realized in retrospect was less than ideal for our residents. Um, it sets the tone for the entire experience, though. So, you know, we provided an orientation when they, our residents came on, but onboarding as a concept is much larger and involves really providing them with information about making this big move to a new place and what kinds of housing exists, what kind of uh, transportation exists, you know, uh, and um, giving them that kind of support. And that's something that we would typically re look to HR to provide, and I think at WVU, HR is starting to um, develop uh, more resources for us, but if it's not there, that's definitely something to keep in mind as you're bringing in new faculty. And it's not just for our resident librarians, this really is applicable for all new professionals coming into an organization, and that's the same thing I'm gonna say for um, uh, mentorship programs. We did include formal mentorship as a feature of our residency program, but it's um, something that we started, but I think kind of fizzled out. And um, I think it's an important aspect uh, for all, again, for all new um, professionals. And um, so now um, WVU Libraries has instituted a mentoring program for all new incoming librarians. And this may be standard procedure at lots of institutions, but at ours it was not. So the next uh, feature would be something that um, Leo talked about at Iowa as well, and that's the idea of rotations. And so this seems to be a pretty standard um, feature of most residency programs. When we were starting out in, uh, actually in 2014 with the planning, we surveyed uh, the landscape of what was out there, um, most included them. Uh, what we learned after the fact was that trying to have seven rotation areas that lasted five weeks each was too much um, and really wasn't, and those were predetermined. We decided these are the areas, this is the, um, uh, the order in which you will uh, rotate through the areas. And um, we just found that that really was not effective for our residents. So. Um, we're moving into a new hiring cycle. This time around, we're trying uh, four uh, rotational areas uh, that the residents will uh, select from a group of eight possibilities. They'll meet with the uh, department heads in those areas uh, prior to making their selections. And so we're, and, and also getting the supervisors involved much earlier in the process, um, giving them some ownership of um, what the rotation through their area will be. In fact, they have to create proposals that the um, uh, resident librarian will review before making uh, meeting with them and making their selections. Um, that was really, um, is, is a change for us, and, and this, this was an area that we hope will be more successful. Um, the timing of it, you know, we're doing it in our first year. Um, Leo's program was uh, attempting to do that in the second year. Before we got started, um, or as we got started with our work, trying to um, look at what didn't work previously, I surveyed through the um, ACRL Diversity Alliance listserv and received responses from um, about eight different institutions about how they, that had residency programs about their rotations and um, some folks are doing it simultaneously. So they rotate for part of their assignment and they're also um, working in a sp specific um, area at the same time. So their, their um, assignment is, is split. Um, the way our program was set up, you did rotations in the first year, and then in the second and third year, you got to choose uh, where you wanted to spend those final uh, two years. Uh, my next point is assessment, and that's something that Leo uh, mentioned as well. Uh, we 
did not do enough uh, assessment throughout the program. We had um, some assessment built into the rotations, which was sort of a closed evaluation, and um, that was not helpful. We had difficulty um, getting department heads to actually do those evaluations, and then the results weren't really shared with the residents. So next time around, it's going to be a collaborative um, facilitated discussion between the residents, department heads, and folks in the um, resident uh, implementation uh, committee uh, to talk through what went well and, and what didn't, and we're hopeful that that's more successful. And then we're still working on the ways that we want to um, uh, assess in the second and third year because the residents will be supervised by the department heads in those areas, but um, you know, we still have a residency program, and I think we, what kind of happened the last time is that once they uh, moved into their department, it's like we fizzled out with our with our part of it. So uh, we don't want to do this next time around. Um, I just want to quickly mention that um, we included um, uh, scholarship, scholarly activity from the very beginning, and um, but I think in our mindsets going into it, this was something that the residents would do in their later years, but it turns out we had really engaged residents who started right off the bat, and so you just want to make sure that the expectations are, are uh, shared and that the support is given uh, for that requirement. Um, this is, it's okay, everything I just talked about was the easy stuff. And this is the hard part. And this is the part that uh, even our keynote speaker um, alluded to this morning, and that's the systemic change. And, um, you know, I can say from experience, it's really important to try to prepare your staff, the faculty and the library staff about um, for um, a residency program um, and make sure they understand the reason why you're doing it. But also I feel that um, this kind of uh, inclusion, inclusion training, cultural competency, all of that kind of training should be a part of our regular professional development opportunities. We're not there yet. We're working on it. We have some new things uh, coming up this year um, that will hopefully help um, with some facilitated training that's going to happen to people all across the libraries who will then bring that back to the library. But um, you know, this is this is the this is the hard part. Um, and organizational buy-in and changing the culture. And my last point, um, which also Leo sort of mentioned too in his adapt and modify, and that's uh, be flexible. Um, and you know, as you assess and as you look at your program and as your residents um, come to you, be ready to, to change course if needed. And um, this is probably the advice that I wish someone had given me in 2015 um, as we started the program was to understand that it's not, it's, it's not finite, it's a work in progress. So that's all I have and thank you all so much. You're like right in my view, Felissa. <laughs> I'll be staring at you for six minutes. I hope that's okay. Um, good morning. Um, I'm Ashley. Um, up until last year, I was the resident librarian at West Virginia University. I gave a similar talk about my experiences at a ACR last year, and when I was asked to do it again, I was so excited because I thought that I could save myself some time and use the exact same script. Unfortunately, I couldn't because it's super dry. <laughs> So when I thought about what to address this morning, um, I thought about some of my successes as a resident, which include being a 2016 IFLA fellow, winning almost $2,000 in scholarships to attend conferences, co-coordinating WVU Library's first open access week, embedding library instruction to first year seminars, co-designing and teaching a three credit course on film and media literacy, being cited in the ARL diversity spec kit, and serving as an academic coach to sophomores. I, thank you. Sometimes you gotta flex. Um, I also thought about the groups of students that I had the pleasure of working with, including student veterans, commuters, and first year students. I could go more into detail, but I wanted to address something that was way more impactful, particularly for me. 
being a resident and focusing particularly on library administration allowed me to see the library as an ecosystem full of intersecting parts. At WVU, we were encouraged to not just learn new things and pick up new skills, but to also model new modes of behavior and practice to build and strengthen this ecosystem. Not only am I a former resident, but for the last two years, I've been an active member of the residency interest group and serve as their, as their representative on the Diversity Alliance Task Force. These experiences have affected not just how I feel about residencies and national service, but also my thoughts on diversity programs, which tend to demonstrate the complexities of trying to fix systemic issues. There are a number of reasons why I wanted to participate in a residency program. At Simmons, I managed our job line and saw a number of residency programs I thought were interesting. Why? Because they seemed like a good entryway into academic librarianship. After graduating from my LIS program, I wanted a job where I could feel, where I could explore different areas of librarianship. Before joining the program, I spent a year working as a reference librarian and wanted to learn more about information literacy. I knew that a residency program would afford me that opportunity. And like many of the residents, while I enjoyed my library science program, um, I felt that there were other areas to explore, particularly like outreach and collection development. Um, I also felt that there were areas to improve within my own professional practice. I believed and still do that residency programs can create well-rounded professionals. After starting my residency and meeting other residents in the Alliance, I realized the structure for each residency was unique. At WVU, as Lori pointed out, we had seven rotations over the course of 10 months in two different library branches. They included archives, access services, metadata, teaching and learning, scholarly communication, acquisitions, and leadership. Each rotation was different in scope, and the projects were vastly different. We were able to develop projects of our own, but for the most part, they were predetermined. My first year was spent going through the rotations and becoming oriented to the library system. For the second year of my residency, I decided to focus on leadership. There are two big reasons. One, I'm always interested in the career trajectories of leaders, and I knew that I would learn a lot working from John Cawthorn and Karen Diaz. And two, I knew that the idea of me, a resident, working in the space would challenge my own views of what leadership is and what a leader looks like. I was also developed, excuse me, I was also interested in learning how library initiatives are selected, developed, and sustained. For over a year, I worked under the Director of Strategic Initiatives in the Dean's Office to help, and develop, um, to help develop and support our projects in the library tied to retention efforts on campus. During these two years, I also presented at conferences, engaged in scholarship, and taught for credit classes. The deans had the residents work closely with the then senior training, senior training and development specialist, Stephanie Masters. Stephanie led us through strengths-based training and made it very clear that while we were residents, we were also change agents. My experience as a resident taught me quite a bit about the complexities of organizational change and the importance of creating a work environment where people feel empowered and are encouraged to see opportunity within uncertainty. There were several challenges during my journey, some of which already may be familiar to most of you, but they include the feeling of isolation that comes with working and living in a place that was not necessarily racially diverse and very hard to travel in and out of. Uh, dealing with an academic appointment that did not match the level of my professional output. Uh, the burnout that comes with being a change agent. And then what is typical for most residents, managing paternalistic attitudes. Any new program is going to have its kinks. And I spent a whole lot of time advocating for my needs and ideas. But luckily, our support team trusted my judgment and were always open to hearing us out. We were always treated like colleagues, and they were very adamant that the experience was about us. The best part of my experience, in addition to now having a really spiffy CV, um, was all the amazing people I've got to meet over the last three years. From deans to LAS students to library staff to my former resident in crime, I now have an awesome network of folks that I can turn to for pretty much anything. It is this network that has helped me transition into my current position, which is very similar to my old job in many ways. There are so many benefits to participating in a residency program, but my three biggest takeaways for those interested in participating or starting a new program are, one, I learned how to be a more effective and empathetic colleague, two, I cultivated my project management skills, and three, I built a strong community of both peer and former mentors. To conclude, I wanted to share a few pieces of advice um, from an article that I co-wrote with another resident for collaborative librarianship. One, be prepared to assess your program before, during and after implementation, as Lori pointed out. Two, provide and encourage robust ongoing diversity and inclusion training for program admins and coordinators. 
And three, always create time for reflection. Thank you. Yeah, uh, my name is Charles Yer. Uh, I work at Iowa State uh, University Library uh, in uh, Research and Instruction Department. Now, uh, I always like uh, starting my story, uh, how it all started. Uh, back uh, so many years uh, in my home country of Kenya, I happen to have had a uh, very elderly Catholic, Catholic uh, missionary priest who always told me why it was very important to make libraries my friend. I was like, how does a building become your friend? <laughs> and he told me, always remember that. Many years down the road, I found myself in the United States. I lived in Jacksonville, North Carolina, and my first job was to work at an apartment complex uh, doing maintenance work. Uh, part of my routine every morning before I started my real job was to go around the complex picking litter from the compound. But one day, a very young little African-American boy approached me. He was about seven or eight years old, and he surprised me by telling me, excuse me, that when I grow up, I would like to become like you. And that got me scratching my head. Become like me, picking later? It kind of disturbed me a little bit. And then I asked him, why did you tell me that? What he told me, I would like to share. But it was very heart-wrenching. Fast forward, I found myself at uh, Columbia in Missouri. I decided to relocate there because it was a college town. I wanted to better myself. And then I found myself attending a career fair. Uh, and at the career fair, I talked to a professor who happened to be working at the School of Information Science and Learning Technologies at the University of Missouri. This professor sold me into librarianship. I didn't know what it was all about because me, besides what my old Catholic priest used to tell me, I thought it was just about books. But anyway, from the talk we had with this professor, I decided to go through the motions of application, did my GRE, and landed a, uh, a position at grad school. When just I was about to graduate, I started looking very closely at job, des job descriptions, and I asked myself, is this something I'm really going to be able to do? Because I had zero experience in this profession. And then soon after I graduated, I couldn't believe what I saw, an advertisement for a residency program. I've always heard about residencies in other fields or practicum, I mean, uh, uh, practicum or uh, 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 internships, but not residencies. So this was the first time I was seeing this, and I was like, wait a minute, this is something I might want to try. And I put in my application, and believe you me, I couldn't believe that uh, I got that position at the University of Iowa. What I remember to date is that that was a very powerful launching pad I got. I got it and held it with both of my hands. I went there with zero experience in this profession. All I started from was just what I had from library school. So uh, the residency program I found myself in was courtesy of uh, the, 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 the Diversity Alliance. 
the first group of uh, four <coughs> institutions that started it, that's Virginia Tech, uh, University of West Virginia, University of Iowa, and American University. Because of that, I can't believe that less than three years today, I'm standing before you to say that it has helped me go this far. The individual and collective uh, support we received, both from our individual institutions and collectively, is something that I'll always hold very dear. It gave me a very wide perspective and understanding of what academic librarianship is all about. Uh, one thing about uh, our residency program was that it was very effectively programmed. And uh, one of the key things that I noticed that made it very successful for me especially was the kind of uh, institutes that we had and what we took from each of those institutes every successive year. For example, uh, our first institute was at the University of West Virginia where we underwent an orientation into the residency program and we also had the opportunity to bond as a cohort and also to network uh, with uh, uh, other participants who are there. We are also given the opportunity to kind of uh, assess our unique individual strengths and to be able to see how best we could build on those to help us go forward. Our next institute was at my uh, host institution, that's the University of Iowa, and here uh, the institute reiterated to us the importance of research and professional service. And uh, the final one was last year in May, and it was co-hosted uh, by Virginia Tech and uh, University, uh, American University. What I liked about the last institute was the opportunity it gave us to prepare for our launching into the, uh, in, in, into, into the profession. We had an opportunity to uh, engage in a, a mock interview uh, which mimics the actual job interview usually uh, uh, made by uh, actual uh, 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 candidates. And uh, after that, we received feedback. The library that we were at, at uh, West Virginia, all staff were asked to come and listen to our presentations and give us their feedback. We were assigned uh, 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 various uh, mentors who aligned with our career interests. And who kind of helped us look through our resumes and stuff like that. And that was really, really helpful. And uh, back it, at my ho host institution, one thing I liked about it, despite what Leo said earlier, it was initially structured in a way that we were supposed to be rotating. But me, when I went to library school, I always wanted to become a reference librarian. Uh, some of the options you were given, like special collection, preservation, and conservation, I had no clue what those things were. You know, I knew they do a lot of cool stuff, but I was like, the time I have is so limited, and I would be better placed, you know, gaining experience in what I really wanted to do. And when we discussed that, then I was led to continue, you know, gaining the kind of experience I thought would be more helpful to me. Generally, the congenial environment at the library really helped me. Everybody would be like, uh, Charles, uh, are you getting what you really wanted to get out of this? I would be, yeah, I like. If you need anything, please come. I'll be willing to help you. <laughs> there are certain things that might seem mundane, you know, like even uh, starting a chart reference, you know, something I'd never done in my life. You know, you sh shadow somebody and, you know, the next thing you are by yourself and the next thing you have a question you can't answer, you go consult and everybody was there willing to help. Things like navigating the IRB process, for example, things I've never done myself before. I would even communicate with an associate dean, and he would be, oh, Charles, give me a very elaborate uh, explanation how to go through the process. So these are things that I take very, very, uh, uh, I hold very, very dearly. Uh, prof my professional development was supported just like any other uh, uh, librarian. For example, I participated in ACRL Teaching with Technology March on Track uh, last year. Uh, that was all courtesy of my home institution. And the mentorship was just superb. I had a colleague who was always willing to co uh, teach a class with me. Uh, whenever he wasn't there, I would go teach that class. He had a one credit course he was teaching. So, those kind of things. And eventually, when I was now starting to look out into the job market, 
these are people who are always willing to look at my application, tell me, Charles, maybe you may want to change this part this way and all that kind of thing. So in conclusion, I would only say that uh, uh, this residency program really gave me a big, big head start. Without it, I, don't, I can't imagine where I would have been. Uh, it boosted my confidence level a lot uh, because through it, there are things that initially I would have freaked about, but today I think I can confront with more confidence. Uh, I'm very happy to hear that uh, the ACRL eventually took the uh, coordinating uh, uh, role for the Diversity Alliance and uh, the membership has now grown from 4 to 36. I think that's really, really encouraging. I believe a lot more people will benefit out of this and maybe at some point uh, when I meet uh, another seven-year-old kid who tells me that he wants to be like me, I might more affirmatively nod and say, yes, I think you, you're thinking right. Thank you very much. Thank you. I had to check my watch. It's now officially noon, so I can say good afternoon. <laughs> We've crossed the line. You know, before I, I start, I want to say that listening to Ashley and Charles really inspires me and excites me about why SRL got into this program, and I just hope that we can continue to do um, more together. So I know you've heard a lot already about the Diversity Alliance. I'm just curious, how many of you had heard about the ACRL Diversity Alliance before you heard about this conference? Did anybody heard of it? Oh, all right, the marketing is working, that's great. Um, how many of you in this audience are working at institutions that are already members of the Diversity Alliance? Excellent, excellent, my comrades are here, so that's lovely. Um, and how many of you are interested in joining the Diversity Alliance? Very good, we hope that uh, by the end of the session you'll have the information you need so that you can go forward and join. So, how did we get into into this. Um, for those of you that don't know, this is uh, John Cawthorn and John Coolshaw, and my apologies to Tyler and to uh, Nancy Davenport. I didn't have a fun picture with them, too. But uh, I was at, uh, I think, a CNI meeting in December of 2015 and uh, was approached by several of these folks, and they're like, Mary Ellen, we got an idea. We want to talk to you about this. And um, I was very interested, of course, one of ASEVRL's core values is diversity and equity and inclusion. And uh, I think one of the things they said was, you know, we've got this program, we've got it up and running, but we want to scale it. And we're four deans, we're busy, we don't have time to scale this up to include as many institutions as we would like to participate. And I was also very glad to hear, um, it may have been Tyler that you said this, um, and I don't think we need to create another 501c3 for people to, <laughs> to belong to. And I'm like, yes, why not work with what we already have? It, it made my little heart <laughs> pitter patter, so that was great. Um, so we kind of talked it through. Um, I attended the University of Iowa Institute in the spring of 2016. I had some informal conversations with um, the ASRL Board of Directors about whether they'd be interested in something like this. They were all very positive and excited to see what we could come up with. And uh, when I was out in Iowa, the uh, four founding deans and I met really tried to flesh out what would this look like. I mean, one of the things um, I think they felt was that trying to have each institution host a, a multi-day institute for the residents was a big lift. That was more than probably most institutions would have the time or resources to support. So what else could we do with that kind of thing? So we, um, you know, kind of fleshed out the ideas for the program that spring. We brought it to the ASRL board in June, and by September of 2016, I was very proud to have launched the ASRL diversity program, complete with logo and everything. And I would say that for um, associations, that's working at light speed. So I was very excited that we could do it that quickly. 
So as Tyler mentioned, um, you know, we kept with the purpose the, uh, of the program, and we really hope that by working together and thinking more broadly, the ACRL Diversity Alliance institutions will help diversify and thereby enrich the entire profession. We all know that we want to be in institutions where the um, people that are working with the students reflect the student body that is there, and we have a long way to go, and what we're hoping is that this program will help with that. Now Tyler's already kind of gone over quickly um, the commitment, so just to review a little bit, you know, uh, one of the questions that we often get is, well, we're interested in being um, a part of the Diversity Alliance, but we don't have a residency program yet. Like, that's all right, you can still join, because then you get access to the institutions that have one, and you can learn from them about how did they set it up, how did they convince the provost or the library director or dean um, for money. So if you're interested and you can commit to your working toward establishing a residency, we would love you to um, be a member. Because that is another important commitment that we ask the institutions to make, is that you will serve as a resource, that you will, as diversity coordinators, um, connect with the other institutions that might have questions and share those ideas. Um, that you will commit to uh, professional development, and, and um, I think Leo said flexibility was one of the things that was really important, and adaptability, and I heard both Leo and Lori talk about the rotation is a good idea, it didn't always work, so be prepared to do something else. Um, and I think that being part of the Diversity Alliance community will give you some of those resources that will help you think through what will work best. And then, of course, providing a salary that would be equal to an entry-level position, um, we ask that you pay a small annual fee to be a member of the Diversity Alliance to help defray the cost of the program and that you recommit each year to the principal. So we will actually ask the dean or the director to each year sign um, a commitment statement to these principals because we recognize that um, the uh, focus of an institution can wax and wane depending on who's in leadership and we want to make sure that the institution remains committed, that the leadership is committed and that the residents have um, the support they need to be in the program. Now, what some of the people said to me, so what do I get out of it? Why should I join? What are the benefits of being part of the ACRL Diversity Alliance? Well, first, I think it's, it's almost in a, a personal thing. I think this is a very important initiative for the profession, and it gives you um, uh, an opportunity to participate in this effort to really improve the pipeline of diverse individuals who will compete for academic and research library jobs. As I mentioned, you get access to the other um, alliance institutions and their coordinators' insights. You get access to their job postings, um, their residency rotation schedules if they have one. We have created an electronic discussion list for all of the Diversity Alliance coordinators where they can ask each other's questions and share ideas. And I believe there are some members that are working on a LibGuide to try and pull all those sorts of things together in an easy, accessible place. We also give you access to the um, ACRL Residency Interest Group, and Ashley and I were just chatting because Ashley, as she mentioned, has been um, active in the Residency Interest Group, and we're trying to make sure that we can make distinct what the Residency Interest Group can do by connecting those individual residents and what the Diversity Alliance can do by more focusing on the institutions and the coordinators and the programs that they are um, developing. We give you a badge. Wouldn't you like to have that digital badge for your website too? It will change the year every year that you recommit and send you a new one. Um, and we have heard anecdotally, and I know Nancy Davenport, uh, one of the founding members, talks about um, the attention that she got from her provost and the difference that being a member of the Diversity Alliance made to the pool of people that she could recruit to her institution. So we're hoping that by adding language to your job ad that you are a member of the ACRL Diversity Alliance and by using this digital badge that that will show that you are creating um, a welcoming environment in which those people might want to um, apply. You've heard several times the numbers. I was filling out paperwork right before I left for another institution to join. So um, too late to get on this list, but I think we're about to finalize uh, the University of Texas um, at Austin becoming our 37th member, and we've had some inquiries, so I hope that others uh, will continue. And some institutions uh, are using the Diversity Alliance um, as a way to highlight and recognize other people. So the University of Delaware named their residency program after someone uh, that was important to that institution that I thought was kind of a cool idea. So what's next? 
Well, we are offering um, a pre-conference for residents and others that might be interested at the ACRL 2019 conference um, in Cleveland. And uh, Margot Conaghan, our professional development manager, is here, so she and I would be happy to talk to you all about the uh, Cleveland conference uh, if you would like. Um, but that will be in April 2019. Um, Gerald Holmes is here, Gerald Wave, uh, UNC Greensboro, applied to IMLS, the Institute for Museum and Library Services, and got a grant to host two more institutes for Diversity Alliance members. So they are working on the planning, and Margo's going to be working with the planning group so that we can put together two more institutes that complement what is going on at the ACRL conference. Um, ACRL created a D Diversity Alliance Task Force to kind of oversee this program in its development stages, and uh, in chatting with the task force of which the four founding deans are members as well as we added some additional people, they felt that um, going to an annual or biennial institute was going to be a more effective way to work, a more reasonable way to work, resources being what they are, than to try and provide two or three institutes a year at each of the participating members. But then you have people like uh, uh, Gerald and UNC Greensboro team that thought, well, maybe we can get some money and do something. So we're open. I mean, we're very much in the uh, growth process. So if you have ideas, we certainly are interested in what might work well for you. Um, what else are we doing? Well, we will reach out to all of the uh, residents in the Diversity Alliance and invite them to apply for scholarships. We've already um, budgeted and have commitments for over $100,000 in scholarships to the ACRL conference in 2019. Some of those will be for library school students, some will be for um, Diversity Alliances, some will be for Spectrum Scholars, which is the ALA um, program to get underrepresented groups into graduate schools of library and information science. Um, even with our scholarship program, we try to have our ear to the ground and listen to what members need. So our scholarship program has al always been aimed for those from professionally underrepresented groups. But after running it for a few years, uh, we heard from mid-career people and said, you're, you're just focusing on students and entry level. What about us mid-career people? So we added five more scholarships for mid-career people trying to respond to that need. Um, we're considering whether the deans and directors of the Diversity Alliance institutions would like to have their own list to talk about issues that are different maybe than what the on-the-ground coordinators are trying to do. So if there's interest, we will create that. I am working on um, a job description. I'd be interested in, in just an informal poll here. One of the ideas I've had, uh, and I've put money in the budget if the uh, if the board will approve the budget in June. And I know I have several board members in the room, including John Lehner, Chair of Budget and Finance. So if they look favorably <laughs> upon this idea, um, I will be creating a Diversity Alliance residency program at the ACRL offices in Chicago. So I, I just would be curious, how many think it would uh, someone getting out of graduate school would like to work at the National Association as opposed to starting out in the library. Do you think there'd be any interest in that? Show your hands. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. I, I wasn't sure because it's not, we don't do, you know, hands-on library work. We do a different kind of work. But we can offer them exposure and networks to a whole nation of, of active, committed librarians that are passionate about the profession. Um, what else are we doing? Uh, this Diversity Alliance I want to put in context of a broader initiative at the ACRL board meeting um, at the midwinter annual con uh, midwinter meeting of ALA in uh, January, no, February, I guess it was this year. I lose track, we moved it. Um, the board voted to approve a brand new strategic initiative on equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, they're defining exactly what that means, but what they wanted to do was do more than just add a goal to a strategic plan. They said this is so important, we don't want a goal that we're going to check off in a few years and say we've have done it. We want to infuse the entire organization with this idea of EDI. So we have a board working group that has been working with some of our leaders to put together sort of a list of suggested programs that we might undertake that will best um, suit the profession in that. Um, we're looking to create more professional development. Uh, I think we'll be issuing a call for curriculum developers to come up with a, a, a road show type of thing on EDI so that we can send some presenters out to your communities to do some EDI work. So we're kind of just starting on the development um, of that idea. And, and conversations here and conversations I had um, with Leo and the other Big Ten HR library directors a year or so ago, we recognize that part of the issue is pipeline. Uh, what the Big Ten HR folks were telling me is like, we're all competing for the same people. 
you know, we, we're, we put an ad out and there's only so many um, people getting out of library school and we're trying to get them or once they're out of the residency, we're trying to get them. So we're, I'm also looking at ideas. What could we do with high school students? How could we get them excited about careers in libraries or academic libraries? The Public Library Association got a grant from IMLS to bring 50 um, high school students to work in the summer in public libraries. Maybe there's something around that that we could do. So I think the board and I are very open and interested in things that we can do to grow the diversity lines, to grow EDI initiatives that will support the profession. And I look forward to talking to you more about that while we're here. I didn't have a slide with my contact information, but there's some postcards out on the tables, and I think there were some more at the registration desk. So please feel free to email us, check out the website, and be glad to answer any questions that you have when we're done. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. This was very, very useful and informative. I'm the diversity uh, residence coordinator at Texas A&M, so also gave me <laughs> extra tips. So we have about 15 minutes for questions. So we have mics out. So please ask questions. <laughs> Did I have a question? Um, can you hear me? Um, when you were speaking about um, feeling isolated in <coughs> these positions and um, whether or not you had you had, a, you had a cohort, you had at least one other person there, I think, and I don't know if you mentioned that you did as well, um, and how important that was, and if you were, if we're working towards some of these um, uh, positions but can only get one, do you have any recommendations for how to address the isolation issue? Um, um, so I was really lucky in the fact that, you know, the <coughs> resident that ended up staying and I were, ended up really close. And so it was really great from the beginning that we sort of had really great synergy. Um, we were able to sort of complement one another. Um, I know that this time around you're having one resident and I think a big part of their, I mean, one, their experience will be different because we know more, we under they understand more. Um, and I think they understand how to better support that person second time around. Um, and I think a big part of it, like Lori sort of talked about, is that it's not just about moving to a new place, new to an institution, it's moving to a new place. And so helping that person sort of orient, not just to the library, but like the campus, right? The space, the town. Um, and I think it also depends on the type of person that you hire, right? Like I think that's one of the biggest issues with these programs is like what kind of resident do you want? Do you want someone who's super green, um, who might need a different kind of support than someone you know, like me, who was, you know, a little bit older um, and had experience um, in libraries and didn't need necessarily my hand to be held, right? Um, and so that's something to also think about when you do have one resident is what kind of resident do you want to have in your program? I hope that answered your question. Can I just add to Ashley's comments? So this time around, we can only hire one uh, resident librarian. and. Um, so we are uh, reaching out to other schools that have residency programs that are within our uh, local region uh, just to see what ways we can have our residents work together and um, you know sort of have um, informal relationships so um, in addition to providing uh, support internally we're we are also looking uh, at the institutions around us and uh, making some uh, connections uh, for our residents I'm sorry, just one more thing. Um, and one of, the, one of the great things that happened to me was I, was I actually met a lot of black faculty on campus, so outside of the library, so meeting like other black faculty or even like PhD students was really helpful. Um, and you know, each institution has like their own sort of social network. And I think really tapping into that before the resident gets there and making sure that they have that information is really important. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Uh, personally, what I noticed was that uh, I think it all boils down to uh, an individual. Uh, sometimes somebody has just that personality to be able to reach out and some people are just not that gifted that way. So I noticed that there are some, some of my colleagues who do a lot better. You could find them, you know, socializing a lot more. But that doesn't mean that those who didn't, didn't have, you know, felt isolated, no. They also just had their own ways of socializing and feeling, you know, uh, accommodated and all that. So I think it all boils down to the kind of person himself or herself. 
and I just wanted to add, while it's not the same as having, you know, three residents in the same um, room or at the same library, I do think that's the role the residency interest group can play. Uh, it's amazing what we can do with video chats now and Zoom and things like that. And so I, the leaders of that group have just been phenomenal about looking for opportunities to bring people together. We can have informal meetups at the conferences. Um, so that there are other people that they can connect with and we're hoping that by having some of these institutes at least annually that gives them another chance to come face to face and have more of a cohort. This is an, another question for Ashley because I noticed that you are an undergraduate of Bates and so I wanted to ask you two questions. One, was there something during your undergraduate experience that um, encouraged you to become a librarian? And secondly, because you have had a experience with a small liberal arts college but are now working at large universities, for those of us that are, are at liberal arts colleges, could you make some suggestions on how we could develop a residency program that would be um, inviting for people to understand how a liberal arts college is different from larger institutions? Thank you. Awesome. Where are you coming from? Um, I'm at McAllister College. Oh, awesome. Right awesome. across the river. Yep. 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 Um, so I teach for a living um, and I believe in transparency in the classroom and I'm very honest with my students that I did not go to the library at all in college. That was not a thing that I did. Um, it wasn't until I had to write a thesis that I actually started going to the library. Um, but what I do think, you know, having a liberal arts background is the idea that, you know, librarianship, is, you have to know everything, right? Like you have to be able to sort of pick up a book or Google anything and learn anything in about 10 minutes, right? Like that's what librarianship is. And I think having a liberal arts education sort of helped prepare me for that, right? Being able to sort of tap into any area, um, any discipline at any given time, because you never know what people are gonna ask you. Um, and I think in terms of having programs at liberal arts college, I think that's a fantastic idea. I think, you know, I work at a really huge university, and while that is awesome, I am, feel so overwhelmed sometimes by the amount of people and things and paperwork that I have to sort of be aware of. And I think maybe having a residency in a really small space might actually be really fantastic for someone that's sort of, especially if it's like their entryway into like academic librarianship, I think it actually might be really great to sort of have that really intimate small space. And um, I think also with liberal arts colleges, you, you guys are doing a little bit of everything, right? Like because you don't have enough staff most of the time. Um, so I think it'd be a really good opportunity for them to sort of tap into different areas and sort of be almost forced to do that. Um, hi, I'm Felissa Mitchell from the University of Virginia, and uh, we are getting our two residents July 1st. Yay! Um, and we got them, and if the program is a success, is because we went out looking and asking questions. We drove Lori crazy with emails. Ashley talked to our committee that put the thing together, and she and Chanel uh, did a piece on how not to do a residency, which has been very, very helpful for us. Uh, where is Chanel, by the way? Having the time of her life in Las Vegas. Uh, okay, good, good to know. Uh, Leo, Leo, I want to say uh, thank you so much for Carmelita Pickett, <laughs> who is starting at UVA uh, soon. Um, with respect to um, um, the residency program, one of the things that we really cared about at UVA is because August 11th and 12th. We didn't know if we would get anybody, and we luckily got 70 applicants, and we chose two. Um, but one of the things that we really worried about is because there's so many different programs, how is it that, I mean, how do we balance it so that we had a very early um, um, cutoff date, because UVA does really early cutoff dates of December 15th, and we wanted to figure out a way so that the residents, because we're looking at a, at you know, a pretty small group of people, how do we make it equitable for them so that you know, if you know, I'm competing with Lori um, Cawthorn at Harvard, so I mean, how do we make it so that people, you know, so we, we actually talked about a, a national match day for our residencies, and I don't know if that would work or not, but it was it's something that really does concern us. Um, and so that's a question for ACRL, actually. Um, and we put it to Howard Prager, too. So, um, And the, the last thing was, um, with respect to high school internships, we're doing our second one um, at UVA. Last year, we, we brought in um, one stu oh, five students for six weeks, one day a week, and it drove everybody nuts. 
Um, so this year we had 65, or actually we had, yeah, we had 65 applicants. We chose six of them and they were there for one week, uh, one day, you know, rotating through. We're paying them 11.54 an hour, which is pretty good for a 16 or a 17 year old. Um, but the next thing is, I was at a conference actually here last month where somebody said, well, why are you bringing them to you? Why don't you go out to them? and talk to them about who, how cool librarianship is. So we, we, we're working on that for the fall. And I'm going to New Orleans for NCORE and talk about, to college students, about what a cool field librarianship is. And hopefully we can stir the waters. And Ashley, I want to call you out for not mentioning UVA in your career path. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think in all that there was a question for ACRL, so uh, let me first start by, uh, at the pre-conference yesterday, one of the things that we surfaced was that there's so many cool things going on that it's hard to keep track of them nationally. Like there's pockets of this excellence and pockets of really exciting things. So I definitely want to keep talking to you about the high school idea because I think nationally that could do a lot for recruiting people from underrepresented groups to the profession. Um, in terms of what the ACRL Diversity Alliance can and can't do, um, we have had some questions about, well, so are you going to find us um, our, uh, our resident? I'm like, uh, gulp, you know, for $500 a year? No, I'm not staffed uh, to do that. Um, I'm open to suggestions if you can think about a way a national match day would work. I'm not that familiar with how the NFL does it. Um, <laughs> Oh, all right, so you know we can learn. One of the challenges uh, that I have seen is that every state has different requirements, every institution has different requirements, so trying to see if there's a way we can cut through all that nationally, I don't know whether that will be the best investment. I'm not saying no, I'm just saying I don't know how to do it right now, but if, if people have ideas, I'd be glad to listen to them and see what we could come up with, and whether it's an affordable, you know, the best use of the resources. I'm going to second the uh, National Match Day as an intriguing idea with the devil in details, <laughs> including the ability to match versus a required search. But it's an intriguing yeah. idea. Uh, I want to say uh, you, you're, you, uh, congratulations on landing Carmelita. You're also getting my daughter this fall, MFA <laughs> program in poetry and creative writing, so be prepared. Uh, what, what I want to say, though, as far as adapting, something you mentioned, uh, applications. And five years ago, when uh, we advertised for our, our cohort, we advertised everywhere. And we're blessed with 192 applications that we had to go through. We adapted with our most recent cohort and only publicized in diversity-related outlets and ended up with under 100, somewhere about 80, 80 applications. So administratively, it saved us time. And we think, though, we can't, we, I, my intuition is that the percentage of candidates were more diverse, but I don't have the data because, as you know, self-identification is voluntary. But that was a change we made to target recruitment. So we just save time and hopefully have a more, more diverse pool. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Nika Thoss. I'm the coordinator of uh, our residency program at American University, one of the founding members. Um, I have had three things I wanted to mention. Um, Americans, residents, don't have a rotation. Um, we're a pretty small organization, about 20, 25 librarians. And our immediate need was having librarians come in to teach for us. So our residents actually do a significant amount of teaching. That's our primary responsibility. Um, and, and, and as we hire residents, we hire for their potential to, and willingness and interest in information literacy. Um, the other thing was um, I recently created a document. Most of our residents are three years. We do have a resident who's two, a two-year residency program. Um, I think soft money. Um, and uh, after working with my first resident and, and, and in the process of hiring our third re resident who's coming in in June, um, I created a benchmark list of where m my colleagues should be in their residency program. So a three-month year, three month mark, six-month mark, 12 to 18 months, and a two-year mark of, of things that um, either I should address as their employer 
or that, that they need to reach. So in the first three, three months, for example, was having a, a significant interest in developing research and service areas. I'm happy to share that document. Um, I also wanted to mention Dr. Jason Alston. He wrote a dissertation on residencies. And um, if you're on the listserv, I can resend the executive summary that he offered us recently. Um, finally, um, I'm the, our, our university librarian, Anansi Davenport, uh, promotes our diversity alliance to the provost. And he's actually given us public accolades for this diversity alliance. So much so that the School of Public Affairs looked at the program and has created a PhD version for their school. Gerald Holmes, University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Um, definitely we're excited about our grant and Dean Martin Harvard joined us in July of 2017. And I think when he interviewed, and of course I was on the search committee, of course I asked about equity, diversity, and inclusion. I, he knew about the residency program and basically my, my nervousness is what, will it continue while you're here as Dean? So I think once he got hired, he had this dream. And when he called me in and said, Gerald, I'd like to apply for this grant, what do you think? I was like, wow. You know, if anything, I'm just happy about having a residency here at UNC at Greensboro. But definitely, we put this together, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say we've been funded. Um, also, what, this is a two-year continuing education project grant. So basically, we're going to have an advisory committee, and Jason Austin, which is our, he was our first resident, will be on that advisory committee and, and basically, um, you know, you're welcome to read a lot of the things that we probably, you know, his experience and how it could have been better. But definitely, it's wonderful that um, actually Jason got his doctorate and our second resident, Leticia Velez, got her doctorate and she's actually a lecturer for the library school at UNC at Greensboro. She's also going to be in this committee along with um, the former dean of North Carolina Central Library School. Irene Owens. So definitely, in addition to the institutes, we're going to have two webinars, and we're also going to start an e-open access journal. So we're going to definitely be looking for opportunities to learn and work on a lot of the things you heard today, and definitely the mentoring, the assessment, they're right up there at the top. Um, I'm, you know, we are right now in the process of hiring our sixth resident, and um, definitely you know, when you hire, you don't know what they may be thinking about doing. And true, working on PhDs was not what, in my mind. But definitely, we left it open, and we shared our profession. We went to conferences, and we let them do what they wanted to do. So I'm really excited to see everybody in the room and even thinking about residency programs. I'm very excited that I have the dean who wants to do this as a vision. And so um, I, I just wish the best for everyone. Absolutely. Just a look. Is this on? Yeah. Uh, a logistics thing. Uh, as you walk out of the doors, you will see uh, a kind of elaborate setup. I'm not sure how they're going to fit 200 people getting food at the same time, but they they get they say that they've done this before. But the plates are on the opposite side of the table, so double sides, plates on the opposite sides, and then of course the seating uh, uh, with cutlery and everything is where we served breakfast. So. Enjoy your lunch, and we'll see you uh, in the afternoon. Thank you.